My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. My subject is trade beyond the imperial frontiers and its impact on the Roman economy. I have published several books on this subject. This lecture is based on a paper I published in the academic journal Classics Ireland. This is part two of a talk on the Emperor Claudius and the Sinhalese king. The question is, did Claudius receive Buddhist envoys? Ancient Sri Lanka was known to the Greeks and Romans as Taprobain. The island was ruled by a powerful royal regime known as the Andrapura Kingdom. Pliny the Elder describes the events that led to a Sinhalese embassy arriving in Rome in about AD 50. A Roman businessman named Annius Ploclamus had tax collectors and merchants working in the Red Sea commerce that operated between Egypt and India. In AD 50, one of these agents, a freedman, was sailing around Arabia when his ship was unexpectedly caught in strong offshore winds. Perhaps his tax collecting duties had delayed his departure from Egypt, and he was sailing late in the season when the prevailing winds were shifting into that quarter. His ship was swept out into the open ocean by the gale, and rather than struggle against adverse weather systems, the pilot decided to run before the storm. They probably expected to make landfall in the Tamil lands, where the outbound Roman fleet were engaged in trade ventures. But the pilot misjudged his course, and the ship sailed south to make landfall in the largely unknown island of Sri Lanka. Pliny explains, While sailing around Arabia, the freedman was carried by gales from the north beyond the coast of Carmani. After a fortnight he arrived at the harbour of Hippuros in Taprobane, where he was entertained with kindly hospitality by the king. In a period of six months he acquired a thorough knowledge of their language. Pliny reports that the freedman landed at a place called Hippuros, which has been identified as Kadira Malai near Manthai. The Tamil name means Horse Hill, which translated into the Greek Hippuros. Pliny explains that the freedman was questioned by the Sinhalese king and gave an account of the Romans and their emperor. The Sinhalese king was especially impressed by the quantity and quality of Roman silver coin carried aboard the trade vessel. Roman merchants who sailed to southern Arabia used bullion and high-value coin to purchase costly incense. The Sabahimarite kingdom produced myrrh, and the neighbouring Hadramat regime had the monopoly on frankincense production in the highlands of Yemen and Dufar. Incense was expensive in Roman markets, with good quality myrrh priced at 16 silver denarii per pound, and the same quantity of second-grade frankincense, costing about five denarii. A Roman merchant guide called the Periplus of the Athraean Sea reports that a considerable amount of money was sent to the Arabian ports as large quantities of coin. This is confirmed by Ostraca custom passes found at the Roman port of Berenike. The records were scratched on pottery tokens documenting the loading of marsipia, coin bags, aboard Roman cargo ships. Eight of the custom records refer to coin consignments of up to 320 marsipia, or 40,000 denarii. A receipt from the Nicanor archive, a transport business operating at Koptos, records that three talents' weight of silver bullion was sent to the Red Sea port of Myos Hormos in AD 62. This quantity of silver was equivalent to about 25,000 denarii. The Roman ship that reached Sri Lanka must have been carrying a vast quantity of pure silver coin. The consignment attracted the interest of the Sinhalese king, who was impressed by the silver purity and the workmanship of the coins. Pliny reports, The king was struck with admiration for Roman honesty, because, 
Among the money found on the captive, the denarii were all equal in weight, although the various figures on them showed that they had been coined by several emperors. This strongly attracted his friendship. During the first century AD, Roman denarii were minted as almost pure silver coins. Die stamps were used to create sharp surface images with Latin text, portraits of the imperial family, and classical deities. Writing in late antiquity, the Greek traveller Cosmos Indicoplustes explains how Roman coins were chosen for export to Sri Lanka on the basis of their design and quality with finely shaped pieces formed from bright metal being specially selected for export. Perhaps the Sinhalese king also admired Roman coinage for the quality of its artwork as well as the consistency of its metal content. The purity was significant because silver was comparatively rare and expensive in ancient India and the Far East. Most silver currency produced by Indian kingdoms was heavily debased and newly minted issues contained recycled bullion from older coins and other metalwork. The silver content in these coins fluctuated according to the financial fortunes of a kingdom, often involving successes in wars, with the capacity to capture and hold revenue-rich ports and cities. By contrast, the Roman Mediterranean was rich in silver resources, produced by generations of large-scale mining operations, such as those in Iberia, Roman Spain. This abundance of silver created a different value appreciation for the metal in Mediterranean markets. Roman currency valued gold to silver at the ratio of 1 to 12, with one measure of gold worth 12 measures of silver. But Eastern civilization placed a higher value on silver and considered one quantity of gold to be worth 10 measures of silver. This gold to silver ratio of 1 to 10 is documented in Indian inscriptions, recording dedications made to Hindu temples in the Western Deccan. Chinese documents recording market payments made on the western frontiers of the Han Empire provide similar values. So it is understandable that the Sinhalese took an interest in the arrival of a Roman cargo ship carrying a large consignment of silver coin. The freedman probably explained Rome's commercial interests in the Indian Ocean, including the acquisition of ivory, turtle shell, pearls, gemstones and cottons, which were all products of ancient Sri Lanka. Pliny reports, They told us that there is greater wealth in their country than in ours, but we make more use of our riches. The Sinhalese may have been vaguely aware of distant Mediterranean kingdoms before they made contact with Rome. Leading Buddhist monasteries in Sri Lanka were patronised by the Sinhalese royal family, and these institutions preserved long-term oral accounts and written records which were collected into annals in late antiquity. Ancient Indian kings also promoted their international dealings on prominent public inscriptions, and these proclamations have entered the historical record. The Sinhalese would have appreciated the scope and power of a large empire from their early dealings with the Mauryan regime, which ruled most of India until 185 BC. The Mauryans conquered and controlled kingdoms and provinces in the Ganges, the Deccan Plateau, the Indus regions and the eastern parts of India. The Mauryan king Ashoka was a convert to Buddhism and sent state-appointed religious missionaries to Sri Lanka to convert its rulers to Buddhist practice. Inscriptions commissioned by Ashoka appear in the language of his subjects, including Sanskrit, Old Persian, and the Greek spoken by Macedonian colonists in the Hindu Kush and eastern Iran. One inscription records how Ashoka also sent envoys and religious representatives to the leading Hellenic kingdoms that ruled the Near East after the disintegration of Alexander's empire. 
the edict reads. The religious message has been won here, delivered to the borders, sent 4,000 miles away, with the Yona Raja, Greek king, Amita Yoko, Antiochus, rules, beyond which there are four further kings, likewise in the south as far as Taprapanai, Sri Lanka. After the breakup of the Mayan Empire, Greek rulers from Afghanistan seized power in the Indus region and established the Indo-Greek realms. Some of these rulers, including King Menander Sotar, converted to Buddhism at a time when thousands of Buddhist devotees in India were making pilgrimages to religious sites far from their homelands. Some of these pilgrims are documented in an early Sinhalese text written in Palai script called the Mahavamsa, or Great Chronicle. The Mahavamsa is a religious chronicle composed in the 5th century AD from information derived from earlier Buddhist annals written in ancient Sri Lanka. It records how, in about 140 BC, the Sinhalese completed the construction of a Buddhist temple on their island known as the Great Stupa. During the inauguration of this architectural marvel, the Sinhalese received many thousands of pilgrims from across India, including devotees from Hellenic Afghanistan and the Indus realms. Some of these devotees were led by a Greek with a Buddhist name who came from the Hellenic city of Alexandria on the Caucasus, Begram. The Mahavamsa states that the elder Yona, Ionian Greek, came from Alessandra, Alexandria, the city of the Yonas, Greeks, with 30,000 devotees. These ancient contacts meant that the Sinhalese had some historical experience of classical civilization through the Indo-Greeks, but did not know about Rome until the arrival of the freedman. The Romans who reached Sri Lanka in AD 50 used the seasonal northeast monsoon to return to the empire the following November. They returned with four Sinhalese envoys, including a chief representative of the king named Ratias. These men travelled from Egypt to Rome to meet with the emperor Claudius and introduce themselves to the Roman government. The freedman probably accompanied the group to translate the ancient Sinhalese language into Latin or Greek. This contact may date to about AD 50, when Claudius had been in power for almost ten years. Pliny offers a detailed account of Roman trade voyages to India, taken from a record that used both Roman and Egyptian calendar dates. Since the two calendars are misaligned, the date of the report can be calculated, and Pliny's information must have been compiled sometime between AD 48 and AD 52. The Periplus of the Athraean Sea records events in northern India when the Saka kingdom in Gujarat captured coastal territories from the Sadhavana regime which ruled the Deccan Plateau. Saka inscriptions from Nasik dated from year 41 to year 46 were set up between AD 51 and AD 56. So this means that the Periplus dates to almost the same period as Pliny's information on Roman voyages to India. Both accounts are separate and distinct, and could indicate a period of intelligence gathering by the Roman state. Perhaps, when the Sinhalese envoys arrived in Egypt, the Roman governor collected merchant accounts to forward to the capital. Central government could ascertain the significance of the Sinhalese kingdom from an account of current monsoon voyages. Or perhaps Pliny's information comes from imperial informants who accompanied the envoys to Rome. The coincidence in dates could explain how a complete trade periplus became copied into imperial records. The Mahavamsa suggests the possible composition of the Sinhalese embassy sent to Rome. It records how 
during the 3rd century BC, a four-party group of Sinhalese envoys travelled to the Mayan court. The envoys included a chief minister who was the king's nephew, a religious instructor, a treasurer, and another ministerial adviser. The envoys were accompanied by a large group of retainers and brought precious stones and pearls as diplomatic gifts. The Sinhalese envoys received by the Emperor Claudius possibly included a similar group of political and financial representatives. Pliny claims that the father of Ratias, the leading envoy sent to Rome, was someone of importance within the Sinhalese kingdom. In ancient Sri Lanka, wealthy nobles donated to Buddhist institutions by employing craftsmen to carve sculptures and prayer cells into natural cave systems and rock faces. Inscriptions found near the ancient Sinhalese capital, Andrapura, record the devotions of a nobleman named Rakai, who could be the Rachias, mentioned by Pliny. Rakai is described as a premier and lord, with one inscription reading, The Cave of the Premier Rakai, Son of the Premier. This Rakai was also married into the royal household, and an inscription from another cell reads, The Cave of Princess, Daughter of the Great King, Gamanai, the friend of the gods, and the wife of the premier Rakai. Gamanai was the dynastic name of the Sinhalese king, Badakabaya, who ruled the kingdom until about AD 63. So the leading envoy sent to meet the, with the emperor Claudius could have been one of the sons-in-law of the Sinhalese monarch. Pliny reports that Rakai told the Romans that his father had been on a distant commercial sailing to a place beyond the Ganges where the Sinhalese traded with a people known as the Ceres. These were the Silk People, possibly the Chinese. Gift-giving was a significant feature in ancient diplomacy, and this procedure was probably followed by the Sinhalese ambassadors. Early Buddhist records suggest that Claudius may have given King Badakabaya a gift of valuable Mediterranean coral as part of their diplomatic exchanges. A 3rd century Pali text called the Dipa Vamsa, or Chronicle of the Island, describes how King Badakabaya adorned the central shrine of the Great Stupa in Sri Lanka with a valuable coral lattice work. He ordered a priceless lattice of corals to be made, covering the surface of the shrine as if it was dressed in a garment. This is significant because India obtained decorative red coral from the Mediterranean and valued this porcelain-like substance as gemstones. An ancient Sanskrit treaty on statescraft called the Arta Sastra explains that red coral came from Alakandaka, which is an Indian rendition of the name Alexandria in Egypt. The study also mentions coral from Vavarnaka, which is described in a Sanskrit treaty on words and grammar as a sea near the island of the Yavanas, Greeks and Romans. This could refer to the Mediterranean Sea around Sicily or Sardinia, both of which have coral-producing coasts. A Hindu text called the Garunda Paranam explains the significance of Mediterranean coral to ancient Indian society. It records that red coral is empowered with the virtue of augmenting the riches and filling the granaries of its wearer. It is said to be the best eliminator of poison and a safeguard against all dreaded evils. An early Indian study on gemstones called the Ratna Pariska explains that. Good coral is tender, smooth and shining and has a beautiful red colour. In this world it procures richness and gains, gives women marital bliss, destroys corruption and illness, and wards off perils such as poison. 
The Artisastra recommends that red coral should be stockpiled in royal treasuries, along with pearls, rubies, beryls, and diamonds. Pliny confirms the value of red Mediterranean coral to Indian society when he reports that coral is as valuable amongst the Indians as Indian pearls are amongst the Romans. He also explains that Indian soothsayers and seers think that coral is a very powerful amulet for warding off dangers. Accordingly, they take pleasure in it both as an object of beauty and as a thing of religious power. The Mahavamsa confirms that King Bhattacabhaya decorated the shrine at the centre of the great temple with a foreign treasure. He had a priceless coral net prepared and cast over the shrine. Further information is provided by a later commentary called the Vamsa Tapakasine. It records that the king sent someone to the overseas country named Romanuka. He had a very red coral brought back and made into a great flame-coloured lattice. This Romanuka is probably a reference to the Roman Empire, which produced red coral, and the material referred to in the text could have been a diplomatic gift from the Emperor Claudius. Unfortunately, the material remains of this Roman treasure do not survive in the ancient Buddhist temples of Sri Lanka. Otherwise, there might have been an extraordinary testament to the political reach of Rome, preserved in a country more than 2,000 miles from the imperial frontiers. Gifts exchanged between ancient regimes were worth a fortune, but other factors were more significant, and according to Pliny, these royal Buddhist ambassadors brought a message that threatened the political stability of the Roman Empire itself. This is the end of part two of a lecture on the Emperor Claudius and the Sinhalese king. Please see part three. Did Sinhalese envoys threaten Rome? For more detailed information, see my books. The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean and The Roman Empire and the Silk Roots. Follow the link below. Thank you.